Abraham Lincoln was born February 12, 1809, in a one-room log cabin on the Sinking Spring Farm near Hodgenville, Kentucky. However, a land title dispute soon forced the Lincolns to move. In 1801, the family moved eight miles north to Knob Creek Farm. In 1816, the family moved north across the Ohio River to Indiana, a free, non-slaveholding territory, where they sailed in Hurricane Township. On October 5, 1818, Nancy Lincoln died of milk sickness, leaving 11-year-old Sarah in charge of a household that included her father, 9-year-old Abraham, and Dennis Hanks, a 19-year-old orphaned cousin. On December 2, 1819, Lincoln's father married Sarah Bush Johnson, a widow from Elizabethtown, Kentucky, with three children of her own. Abraham became very close to his stepmother, whom he referred to as mother, while others referred to her as Sally. Later, Sarah died on January 20th, 1828, while giving birth to a stillborn son. As a youth, Lincoln disliked the hard labor associated with frontier life. In early March 1830, several members of the extended Lincoln family moved west to Illinois, a non-slaveholding state, and settled in Macon County. In 1831, as Thomas and other members of the family prepared to move to a new homestead in Coles County, Illinois, Abraham was old enough to make his own decisions and struck out on his own. Traveling down the Sagamon River, he ended up in the village of New Salem in Sagamon County. Later that spring, Denton Afoot, a New Salem merchant, hired Lincoln and some friends to take goods by flatboat from New Salem to New Orleans via the Sagamon, Illinois, and Mississippi Rivers. In 1832, at age 23, Lincoln and a partner bought a small general store on credit in New Salem, Illinois. Although the economy was booming in the region, the business struggled and Lincoln eventually sold his share. That March, he began his political career with his first campaign for the Illinois General Assembly. He had attained the local popularity and could draw crowds as a natural contour in New Salem. Though he lacked an education, powerful friends, and money, he advocated navigational improvements on the Sengen River. Lincoln finished eighth out of 13 candidates. Lincoln served as New Salem's postmaster and later as county surveyor. He then decided to become a lawyer and began teaching himself law by reading Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England and other law books. His second campaign in 1834 was successful. He won election to the state legislature. Though he ran as a Whig, many Democrats favored him over a more powerful Whig opponent. Admitted to the bar in 1836, he moved to Springfield, Illinois, and began to practice law under John T. Stewart. Lincoln became an able and successful lawyer with a reputation as a formidable adversary during cross-examinations and closing arguments. In 1840, Lincoln became engaged to Mary Todd, who was from a wealthy slave-holding family in Lexington, Kentucky. They met in Springfield, Illinois in December 1839 and were engaged the following December. A wedding set for January 1, 1841 was canceled when the two broke off their engagement at Lincoln's initiative. They later met again at a party and married on November 4, 1842. In 1844, the couple bought a house in Springfield near Lincoln's law office. In 1846, Lincoln was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, where he served one two-year term. He was the only Whig in the Illinois delegation. On foreign and military policy, Lincoln spoke out against the Mexican-American War, which he attributed to President Polk's desire for military glory, that attractive rainbow that rises in showers of blood. Lincoln also supported the Wilmot Proviso, which, if it had been adapted, would have banned slavery in any U.S. territory won from Mexico. Lincoln supported General Zachary Taylor for the Whig nomination in the 1848 presidential election. Taylor won and Lincoln hoped to be appointed commissioner of the General Land Office. The administration offered him the consolation prize of, of secretary or governor of the Oregon Territory. This distant territory was a democratic stronghold and acceptance of the post would have effectively ended his legal and political career in Illinois, so he declined and resumed his law practice. Lincoln returned to practicing law in Springfield handling every kind of business that could come before a prairie lawyer. In 1849, he received a patent for a flotation device for the movement of boats in shallow water. The idea was never commercialized, but Lincoln is the only president to hold the patent. In late 1854, Lincoln ran as a Whig for the U.S. Senate. He later dropped out, drawing on the anti-slavery portion of the Whig Party and combining free soil, liberty, and anti-slavery Democratic Party members. The new Republican Party formed as a northern party dedicated to anti-slavery. Lincoln was one of those instrumental in forging the shape of the new party. 
On November 6, 1860, Lincoln was elected the 16th President of the United States. He was the first president from the Republican Party. His victory was entirely due to the strength of his support in the North and West. No ballots were cast for him in 10 of the 15 Southern slave states. On December 20, 1860, South Carolina took the lead by adopting an ordinance of succession. By February 1, 1861, Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas followed. Six of these states then adopted a constitution and declared themselves to be a sovereign nation, the Confederate States of America. The Confederacy selected Jefferson Davis as its provisional president on February 9, 1861. Lincoln directed his inaugural address to the South, proclaiming once again that he had no intention or inclination to abolish slavery in the southern states. There has never been any reasonable cause for such apprehension. Indeed, the most ample evidence to the contrary has all the while existed and been open to their inspection. It is found in nearly all published speeches of him who now addresses you. I do but quote from one of these speeches when I declare that I have no purpose, direct or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so and have no inclination to do so. William Tecumseh Sherman talked to Lincoln during an inauguration week and was sadly disappointed at his failure to realize that the country was sleeping on a volcano and that the South was prepared for war. On April 12, 1861, Confederate forces fired on Union troops at Fort Sumter, forcing them to surrender and began the American Civil War. On April 15th, Lincoln called on all the states to send detachments totaling 75,000 troops to recapture forts. This call forced the states to choose sides. Virginia declared its succession and was rewarded with the Confederate capital, despite the exposed position of Richmond so close to Union lines. North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas also voted for succession over the next two months. After the Battle of Fort Sumter, Lincoln realized the importance of taking immediate executive control of the war and making an overall strategy to put down the rebellion. Lincoln encountered an unprecedented political and military crisis, and he responded as commander-in-chief using unprecedented powers. He expanded his war powers and imposed a blockade on all the Confederate shipping ports, dispersed funds before appropriation by Congress, and after suspending habeas corpus, arrested and imprisoned thousands of suspected Confederate sympathizers. Despite his dissatisfaction with McClellan's failures to reinforce Pope, Lincoln was desperate and restored him to command of all forces around Washington to the dismay of his cabinet. Two days after McClellan's return to command, General Robert E. Lee's forces crossed the Potomac River into Maryland, leading to the Battle of Antietam in September 1862. The ensuing Union victory was among the bloodiest in American history, but it enabled Lincoln to announce that he would issue an Emancipation Proclamation in January, having composed the proclamation sometime earlier. Lincoln had waited for a military victory to publish it to avoid being perceived as a product of desperation. After the 1862 midterm elections, he replaced McClellan with Ambrose Burnside. Burnside, against the advice of the president, prematurely launched an offensive across the Rappahancock River and was stunningly defeated by General Lee at Fredericksburg in December. Lincoln brought in Joseph Hooker despite his record of loose talk about the need for a military dictatorship. Privately, Lincoln concluded at this point that the slave base of the Confederates had to be eliminated. However, the emancipation was a stumbling block to peace and reunification. Although he said he personally wished all men could be free, Lincoln stated that the primary goal of his actions as the U.S. president was that of preserving the Union. My paramount objective in this struggle is to save the Union, and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. The Emancipation Proclamation issued on September 22, 1862, and put into effect on January 1, 1863, declared slaves free in 10 states, not then under Union control. Lincoln spent the next 100 days preparing the army and the nation for emancipation. Enlisting former slaves in the military was official government policy after the issue of the Emancipation Proclamation. With the Great Union victory at the Battle of Gettysburg in July 1863 and the defeat of the Copperheads in the Ohio election in the fall, Lincoln maintained a strong base of party support and was in a strong position to redefine the war effort, despite the New York City draft riots. The stage was set for his address at the Gettysburg Battlefield Cemetery 
on November 19, 1863, defying Lincoln's predictions that the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, the address became one of the most quoted speeches in U.S. history. In 272 words and three minutes, Lincoln asserted the nation was born not in 1789 when it won its independence, but when it declared it in 1776, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the purpose that all men are created equal. He defined the war as an effort dedicated to these principles of liberty and the equality for all. The emancipation of slaves was now part of the national war effort. He declared that the deaths of so many brave soldiers would not be in vain, and slavery would end as a result of the losses, and the future of the democracy in the world would be assured that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Lincoln concluded that the American Civil War had a profound objective, a new birth of freedom in the nation. While the war was still being waged, Lincoln faced re-election in 1864. Lincoln was a master politician bringing together all the main factions of the Republican Party and bringing in war democratics as well. To broaden his coalition to include war democratics as well as Republicans, Lincoln ran under the new label of the new Union Party. On March 4, 1865, Lincoln delivered his second inaugural address. He also became the first president to be elected from the Union Party. General Ulysses S. Grant impressed Lincoln and made Grant a strong candidate to head the Union Army. He obtained Congress's consent to reinstate Grant the rank of Lieutenant General, which no officer had held since George Washington. On April 9th, Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox, and the war was effectively over. Shortly after Lee's surrender, a general had asked Lincoln how the defeated Confederates should be treated, and Lincoln replied, let him up easy. In keeping with that sentiment, Lincoln led the moderates regarding Reconstruction policy. His amnesty proclamation on December 8, 1863, offered pardons to those who had not held a Confederate civil office, yet not mistreated Union prisoners, and would sign an oath of allegiance. Lincoln signed many important legislation, including two measures to raise revenue for the federal governments, tariffs, and a new federal income tax. Lincoln signed the Revenue Act of 1861, creating the first U.S. income tax. This created a flat tax of 3% on income above $800, which was later changed by the Revenue Act of 1862 to a progressive rate structure. Lincoln also presided over the expansion of federal government's economic influence in several other areas. The creation of the system of national banks by the National Bank Act provided a strong financial network in the country. It also established a national currency. In 1862, Congress created, with Lincoln's approval, the Department of Agriculture. In 1863, Lincoln declared the final Thursday in November of that year to be a day of thanksgiving. In June 1864, Lincoln approved the Yosemite Grant enacted by Congress, which provided unprecedented federal protection for the area now known as Yosemite National Park. Unfortunately, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth. On Good Friday, April 14, 1865, while attending a play at Ford's Theater, as the American Civil War was drawing to a close. The assassination occurred five days after the surrender of Robert E. Lee and the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. Booth was a well-known actor and a Confederate spy from Maryland, though he never joined the Confederate Army. In 1864, Booth formulated a plan to kidnap Lincoln in exchange for the release of the Confederate prisoners. After attending an April 11, 1865 speech, in which Lincoln promoted voting rights for blacks, Booth changed his plans and became determined to assassinate the president. Learning that the president and Grant would be attending Ford's theater, Booth formulated a plan with conspirators to assassinate Lincoln and Grant at the theater, as well as Vice President Johnson and Secretary of the State Seward at their homes. At the last minute, Grant decided to go to New Jersey to visit his children instead of attending the play. Lincoln's bodyguard, John Parker, left Fort Sear during intermission to drink at the saloon next door. The now unguarded president sat in his state box in the balcony. Seizing the opportunity, Booth crept up from behind and at about 10.13 p.m. aimed at the back of Lincoln's head and fired at point blank, mortally wounding the president. Major Henry Rathbone momentarily grappled with Booth, but Booth stabbed him and escaped. After being on the run for 12 days, Booth was tracked down and found on a farm in Virginia. After refusing to surrender to Union troops, Booth was killed by Sergeant Boston Carbett on April 26th. Dr. Charles Leal, an Army surgeon, found the president unresponsive. 
barely breathing and with no detectable pulse. Having determined that the president had been shot in the head and not stabbed in the shoulder as originally thought, he made an attempt to clear the blood clot, after which the president began to breathe more naturally. The dying president was taken across the street to the Peterson house. After remaining in a coma for nine hours, Abraham Lincoln died at 7.22 a.m. on April 15th. Lincoln's flag enfolded body was then escorted in the rain to the White House by Union officers while the city's church bells rang. The late president lay in the East Room and then in the Capitol Rotunda from April 19th to April 21st. For his final journey with his son Willie, both caskets were transported in the executive coach and for three weeks, the Lincoln Special Funeral Train, decorated in black bunting, bore Lincoln's remains on a slow, circuitous waypoint journey from Washington, D.C. to Springfield, Illinois, stopping at many cities across the North for large-scale memorials attended by hundreds of thousands, as well as many people who gathered in formal trackside tribunes with bands, bonfires, and hymns, singing or silent reverence, with hat in hand, as the railroad procession slowly passed by. Black Americans were especially moved, in presidential ranking polls conducted in the United States since 1948, Lincoln has been rated at the very top in the majority of polls. Generally, generally the top three presidents are rated as 1. Lincoln, 2. George Washington, and 3. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. In the 21st century, U.S. President Barack Obama named Lincoln his favorite president and insisted on using Lincoln's Bible for his swearing in of office at both his inaugurations.